Dick Smith, you've written a new book called Dick Smith's Population Crisis. Why is it so difficult in Australia to have a rational debate about uh-huh. population? <laughs> Well, first of all, we're addicted to growth, but when I speak to the politicians, it's quite interesting. Most of them blame Rupert Murdoch, of all things. They say, oh, if I mentioned anything about population or the fact that we can't always have growth, the Murdoch press will attack me. And it's amazing how I don't think Rupert would realise the power he has in, in effect in intimidating politicians from talking freely. Do you think it's legitimate for a news organisation to push a line in the way that, for example, The Australian does? I think it's quite unusual in the way that Rupert Murdoch actually has decided that climate change is a real problem and he's going to the considerable expense of making News Limited carbon neutral. So he's certainly, and that's going to add to cost without any doubt, but his editors for some reason attack anyone who supports Australia becoming carbon neutral. So I think that's hypocritical and I don't, I think it should be communicated that there's hypocrisy there. I want to just pull out to to a global context because your book's very much about uh, population growth as a global issue. It's forecast that the world's population is set to reach around 9 billion people in, in 2050. Do you think we'll ever reach that figure or do you think that resources depletion, oil, food, commodity shortages will actually, will actually limit this growth? It's interesting. My book, as you rightly say, talks about 9 billion. In fact, the United Nations has revised the figure to 10 billion and uh, before they believe we're going to start sort of curving down or possibly we'll run out of food. Um, I, yeah, I think the world could get to 9 billion because as long as we keep getting oil out of the ground and we've probably got another 50 years of doing that, we can convert oil into food. And so there's a chance you can have decent populations. Also remember that something like over 1 billion of people are malnourished and probably 3 billion basically live on a few dollars a day. So that's the only way we can do it. If you wanted everyone to live at our material standard of living, it'd be equivalent to having 20 billion people on this earth, and that'd be completely unsustainable. I guess in the meantime, the fastest way to reduce global population growth is actually to educate women in the developing world. Can you explain this link briefly? Once you educate people, especially young women, and especially if you give them control on their own fertility, they make sensible decisions. And I'll give you an example. Uh, In Japan, they actually have a reducing population. It's predicted to go from 120 million to about 90 million by 2050. And that's purely because young women in Japan are just not having as many kids. Now, the Japanese government is paranoid about this. They've got $20,000 baby bonuses, and it's still having no effect. And I think the real reason is that Japanese women are sensible. They realise that Japan's a small country, that there's probably going to be food shortages, and they tend to have less children because of that. Uh, My belief is once you raise the standard of living of people to be able to empower them to make their own decisions, they make sensible decisions. But how do you raise the standard of living in, in developing countries, which I think you need to educate women, How do you raise the standard of living without increasing the resources use globally to a dangerous degree? I cover that in the book. It's a real quandary. And in fact, what we're going to have to do is raise the standard of living in third world countries then to stop the growth. And that's going to be very difficult. Uh, Without any doubt, they're going to be using more resources. So it's a short term peak to get to a long term gain. Alternatively, which I think could also happen, is that the marketplace basically decides. And in that case, it's a bit like whether we are like locusts. Locusts breed in billions and then die in billions of starvation. And possibly that's what we could be like. I canvass in the book that maybe because we are relatively intelligent, we can make a decision to not have that huge drastic effect. I'm not sure. I would love to see us have leaders who can stop the growth and live in balance, but I'm not sure if that'll happen. There is another way that global population may decrease for us, I guess. Arguably, peak oil will reduce the global population and reduce the climate change risk in the sense that global population growth has been tied to oil production for about 100 years. Do you think there's any likelihood that that this will have a major impact? Well, it will be a drastic one. You're absolutely correct. If you remember, people like Paul Ehrlich predicted that there would be starvation in the Western world in the 1890s. They were wrong because they underestimated our ability of turning oil into food. And that's through fertiliser, of course, and big farming machinery. Now, the oil's going to run out. We are very close to peak oil, or if not past it, oil will run out. 
I think future generations are going to say to us, what, you used the oil that we needed for food, you used it to fly to Bali for holidays? Why didn't you holiday in Australia and leave some of it for us? That's how selfish we are. But the most important thing in my book is not so much population, it's the fact that we have an economic system that's unsustainable. So you have our government talking about sustainable population and so forth. No one is game to admit that an economic system which is based on perpetual growth in the use of resources and energy, which ours is and the Western world's is, is not sustainable for a start. So you actually have to change the economic system. Otherwise, even if we contain population levels by starvation, we'll run out of resources. I wanted to bring it closer to home now because this is an important part of, of your book. But because I also think it's important to distinguish what's happening in the rest of the world to what's happening here. Uh, you mentioned cities like Lagos and Shanghai, which are already, in, in terms of single city populations, bigger than our entire national population. So there is an issue of scale in that I don't think you can use all of the arguments that uh, apply to developing world problems to Australia. You're absolutely correct. And it's interesting... Uh, people ask me, you know, well, what's the number Australia can have in the population? And I say, well, we could have 100 million. I mean, you could put 10 Dubais between Brisbane and Cairns if you were that crazy. Uh, there'd be advantages for wealthy people because wealthy people will make more money having more consumers. But for the typical Australian, I think it's all downhill. You get to an optimum, uh, I call it a, a sort of a a sweet point, you could describe it. And I think we must be pretty close to that now, where you've got efficiencies of scale, but you don't have the disadvantages of too many people. The United States is a good example. 100 million people, 300 million people in the land mass, about the same as Australia. Its gross domestic product per person is below that of Australia now. So it's clearly gone past the sweet point. They're suffering from obesity. There's too much of a good thing. Now, in having 10 Dubais between Brisbane and Cairns, what we'd have to do is desalinate every bit of water. We'd actually desalinate water for run it for crops. We'd have it all in greenhouses. We would have to use every bit of uranium we have for nuclear energy to generate uh, that, the power for the desalination. I, once again, I go back, what would the advantage be for typical Australians? I believe there would be no advantage. I think a lot of the issue with population growth in Australia is born out of also the, the growth in particular parts of Australia, as in the western suburbs of Sydney, the outer suburbs of Melbourne. But there's surely a lot to be gained from uh, moving the resources around and fixing infrastructure in regional areas. For its, its yes, I don't agree with this, but it is a very common belief that we don't have too many people, we just have too many people in some places. And if we end up with large amounts of pity, uh, people away from the, the coast where we cling. Now, here are the problems. First of all, we are an arid country. We don't have a rocky mountain range through the centre of our country, which in the United States generates the most extraordinary amount of water for the Mississippi River and for the Colorado River. And that allows huge inland cities. We don't have such a mountain range. We're basically arid. The, the reason that uh, people don't live inland, first of all, it's dry. There's not a lot of water there. There are not many jobs there. Would we be able to create jobs inland? I'm sure we would, but why would you want to? See, it's, it seems to be this obsession that you have to have growth. And, and at the present time, we do. We'll go into recession if we don't keep using more resources. The point I bring out in the book is one day you actually have to run without exponential growth in the use of resources and energy. I think we should plan for that now, not later. In the meantime, though, I think uh, if you look at Australia in comparison to other nations in the world, we're one of the world's richest, we're one of the world's least populated and best fed, also per capita amongst the most watered countries in terms of water usage. Arguably, we've got a responsibility to other countries to, to free up some of these yeah. resources. Yes, it's often said that we can take sort of the people from other countries, but let's look. I mean, there's a billion people that are malnourished at the moment. How many could we take? 10 million? I mean, if we took 10 million, our standard of living would drop so dramatically, it would be a completely different country. And so really, by shifting people around the world, it's not going to solve our problem. We need to cope with the fact that you can't always have growth. And how do you propose that we reduce population growth in Australia? What's the actual mechanism by which we do this? 
We, we, first of all, we don't have a problem with, uh, with our birth rate because uh, at the moment we are trying to pay people to have more kids. Uh, I think that should be removed if you re remove the baby bonus. Australian families make pretty sensible decisions and even though some have six or eight kids, on average we have about two kids and uh, that's really sensible. Uh, to top the growth rate, I would suggest bringing the immigration rate from around about 280,000 a year down to about 70,000, which is quite high per capita by international standards, but it will tend to allow us to stabilise the population, which I think is a good idea because I think the whole world has to stabilise. If you look at nature, um, it's interesting how most of the creatures in nature live in this most wonderful balance. I happen to love the beautiful uh, lorikeets, the most beautiful birds that we have. Uh, especially the sulphur crested cockatoo. And you look at them, they're in their small groups. I bet the number we have in Australia is probably the same for the last few hundred thousand years. They've reached this niche in nature. Well, human beings have to do that. Now, we haven't done that at the moment. If you look at the curve, and I show it in the book, it's not a curve, it's a vertical rise. Imagine this, it took us over 10,000 years to get to our first billion people, human beings on this earth. We now get another billion every 13 years. Now, you don't have to be very bright to know that that is going to collapse. We are like an express train going towards a cliff and everyone's stoking the boiler, which is economic growth. Fortunately, the people of my age are going to be, we won't be on the train when it goes over the cliff, but the younger generations will be. That's why we should be doing something. And do you have a particular target in mind? Yeah. For Australia's population? No, look, I have really no idea. I did mention in the book, uh, I'm a, a disciple of the Labor backbencher, Kelvin Thompson, who I think is talking about stabilising about 26 um, million people. It's interesting, Tim Flannery, I think, thought the sustainable number in Australia is less than 10 million. Uh, we've got to be very careful here because the most misused word in the world, and certainly in Australia by politicians, is the word sustainable. They now shove sustainable in front of everything. I've even heard the oxymoron sustainable population growth. There's no such thing. Sustainable basically means that it can be continuing. Now, Aboriginal people have lived here for over 10,000 years, so it's pretty clear that their lifestyle was sustainable. We've been in the modern Australia uh, for 230 years or so. What we're doing isn't sustainable. Fortunately, there's about 5,000 times more energy than we use even at our wasteful present sense, uh, coming from the sun every day. So eventually we'll be able to use energy from the sun for our energy means, but that won't solve the problem of this exponential growth in population. We'll have to stabilise that as well. In the meantime, there's an interesting chapter in your book about food, about the food supplies around the world and the amounts of food needed to feed people. Uh, while the world's poorest people are forecast to grow hungry, as you're saying, in, in, in larger and larger numbers. You do raise the interesting paradox. In, in Australia, we're suffering a, through a, an <laughs> obesity epidemic in some ways. Uh, we waste extraordinary amounts of food and resources. So I just wondered, rather than advocating for less poor people in the world, shouldn't the first response to this imbalance to rebalance? Yes. First of all, We've clearly gone past the sweet point. We're following the United States now where we've got an obesity e epidemic that for the first time in the world with some of these modern Western countries, longevity is actually decreasing. Too much of a good thing sort of thing. Now, this is a separate issue to the population issue, the fact that the disparity in wealth is so staggering. Now, we've got a billion people who are basically malnourished, virtually starving, and then we've got countries suffering from obesity because we've got too much food. That's slightly different to what I'm covering, but it does all go back to the thing that we lost, we've lost the plot. We tend to think, and this has really started in the Second World War, where up until the Second World War, we used the incredible productivity gains of capitalism to reduce working hours, because otherwise you'll end up with unemployment. Since the Second World War, when we brought in the measure of gross domestic product, which really came from wartime output, uh, we judge our governments and we judge our company executives from growth by using more, by spending more. And that's ridiculous because, first of all, perpetual growth is like a perpetual motion machine. It's impossible. In the end, it must crash. And 
to me, we've forgotten about equity. In other words, some countries are incredibly wealthy while people are very poor. We've got to rebalance the whole thing. My belief, and I cover this in the book, is that we can have a fantastic system here that lives in balance, that doesn't rely on this exponential growth in the use of resources and energy. Coupled with that, we're going to have to spend more money in assisting third world countries in raising the education of people because then the population growth level will go down. Then they'll be able to feed themselves and have a decent amount of food and be able to be kept warm, which to me is a basic human right. Would you give primacy to, to the argument that they need to rebalance the use of resources around the world to reallocate is stronger than the need to reduce population growth in, in these countries? No, I think both has to, has to be done at the same time. But I think the thing we should be doing in the Western modern world is getting rid of our growth addiction. Because the, 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 what we've got at the moment is clearly unsustainable. And no one's game to admit this. In other words, the government's saying sustainability, sustainability, but our basic economic system based on perpetual growth is not sustainable. And you've got to get someone to admit to that. I can't get any politician to say it. I met with both the leader of the opposition, Tony Abbott, and then with Julia Gillard before the election. And I said, look, will you do one thing for me? Will you just tell the Australian people that we can't always have growth in the use of resources and energy? And they both in their political way basically said, in effect, I couldn't say that. In other words, we're supposed to be so stupid as a population, you can't have a leader telling you the truth. And I'm not saying that you can stop this growth immediately. We will have recession without any doubt. There'd be people out of work, terrible things would happen. But it needs to be planned for. And if it's planned for over a number of generations or at least decades, as I've shown in the book, we can have a fantastic system of capitalism, but one that lives in balance. We'll still have growth, but the growth will be in quality of life. It'll be in growth in efficiencies growth of using energy from the sun rather than digging it up in the ground. But it'll be a different type of growth. Now, in the meantime, we've got to allocate more money and we'll have an excess of money because we won't be building, grow, uh, uh, producing as much stuff that's not necessary. We can then use that to distribute to so-called third world countries to raise their standard of living. Then their population growth will drop. I just wanted to touch on, uh, I guess, it's an issue that you hold off until later in the book and there's a good reason for it. It's, it's an issue that needs a lot of time to discuss. Climate change is, is a part of all of these problems Absolutely. to some extent. Uh, and you write that it's a problem that is exacerbated by rapid population growth and there's no way on earth that the yeah. earth can support in developing countries, people living the way that we live in the West, as in there's simply not enough resources for everyone to live the way that we live. So again, I, I would have thought that in some ways we need to look at our own consumption rather than limiting the growth in, in other countries. Well, it's both, but it's interesting. Can you imagine uh, all the government people went off to Copenhagen to discuss human-induced climate change but they didn't mention the elephant in the room. Humans, no one mentioned population. I was looking for someone holding up a sign, population question mark, it wasn't allowed to be mentioned because population is growth and that's the problem. Now, at the moment, most of my wealthy friends don't accept that humans could be affecting climate. I don't know for sure. Common sense says, seems to me as if you burn up uh, fossil fuels which have been sequestered over hundreds of millions of years. If you burn them up in 100 years, you might affect the climate. I've flown around the world five times as an adventurer at very low levels, at 500 feet in altitude. I've seen the damage that human beings have done to the earth. And even before I'd ever heard of the word climate change, I came back from my solo flight in 1983 and I remember saying, I can't believe that we could do this amount of damage to the earth and, and have no consequences because I didn't know we were having them. So when I heard about climate change, I thought, well, that seems to fit with common sense. And what I find fascinating is that uh, Rupert Murdoch is making all of his companies carbon neutral because he really believes it's a problem. But then you have his media here basically uh, absolutely attacking anyone who thinks that Australia should become carbon neutral. And I have no doubt we can become 
carbon neutral because we have so much energy from the sun, it's going to be incredibly expensive. Because one of the reasons we have such a high material standard of living is we're using fossil fuels at far lower cost than we should be because they're irreplaceable. Can I just ask, with the News Limited uh, newspapers, most particularly the Australian, why do you think that they have this position regarding carbon pricing? I think there's a complete lack of direction. I think News Limited has got too big. And you only have to look at News Limited. Look what's happened recently. In the United Kingdom, uh, staff of News Limited have been caught uh, criminally tapping phone lines. And uh, I think News Limited allocated $30 million for compensation. Now, Rupert Murdoch would never have allowed that if he knew about it. The same here in Australia. In the Kerry Stokes case, the News Limited chief counsel, the judge said that he had lied, just told lies. And uh, I find that if something gets so big, obviously globalisation has advantages, but something that big, in the end, you get dishonesty creeping into the network. And I think what's happened with News Limited, you've got Rupert saying, look, I think there's problems with climate and News Limited are going to lead the way. We're going to show leadership by becoming carbon neutral. But it's almost as if his editors don't know that. And instead of showing any leadership, what they're doing is just beating up everything to try and get the maximum circulation. Now, that might be good for making a dollar, but it's certainly not good for the future of our country and our world. And I'm trying to motivate Rupert. I've said, look, you've made $6 billion. You're one of the most successful newspaper magnates in the world. How, a bit of, how about a bit of noblesse oblige and coming back to Australia and showing the leadership we need so we can get over some of our present problems? I think healing the rift between News Limited and the Greens is, uh, is going to be a bridge too far. I'm not sure if, even that you could manage to do that. You're absolutely right. But that type of capitalism that Rupert uh, presides over is doomed. I can tell you that the... And even though I've benefited out of it staggeringly, I've made a fortune out of the growth economy, that something which depends on exponential growth in the use of resources and energy is doomed because it's a finite world. And what I show in the book is we can have a fantastic system of capitalism, but just that lives within balance. And it's interesting, a lot of people I've read who have <laughs> looked at this uh, having an economy without growth say we need a new system which is based on cooperation and idealism. Well, I can't see that happening with human beings. We've basically evolved on this earth because we've selfishly removed anything that threatened us. But knowing capitalism as I do and having benefited from it, just as we've brought very strong laws in, uh, first of all, laws against slavery and capitalism existed without slavery, even though it was predicted it would fail, we've brought the most draconian, some people would say, laws on environmental protection. Uh, capitalism just works around it. It's so productive. It, the productivity increases are so great because of the ingen ingenuity of human beings. And so we now work with the most extraordinary uh, laws in relation to the environment and, and capitalism still makes money. When we bring in laws, and I've actually suggested in my book that we actually will bring in laws that will not allow us to advertise anything that's not produced sustainably. And that means the TV games and the things that are just produced to last for 12 months and be thrown out, they will be illegal to advertise. Now, I'm amazed I haven't been attacked because of this, because I've benefited so much from advertising and selling things which are not sustainable. But all that happens then is that companies will make their money by being smarter. The 2 or 3% productivity gains from capitalism will be used to lower costs. Uh, Woolworths, instead of having more people to buy their product, will have to say how can we have less packaging or how we can have uh, less costs of moving the goods around Australia. And so every year we'll get a 2 or 3% gain. But then instead of using that productivity gain to make more stuff, which is the only way we can keep, keep people employed at the moment, we'll use the productivity gains to reduce working hours. So I can see a situation where you have a lot more leisure time, but you still get paid the same. But when you go to a shopping centre, 50% of the stuff's not rubbish that you don't really need. I think inevitably, though, there'd also be a, a, a gradual decline in, in our sort of way of life, in the sort of leisure activities that... Um, that people have now. You know, we live in houses which are gigantic with several televisions. Do you think people are prepared to reduce, like, their, their quality of life? Well, no, I, I think they have it? a better quality of life, but there'll be probably less material things. Now, I'm a good example. I have lots of aircraft and helicopters and things like that, but 
I get my greatest enjoyment just going bushwalking in the Blue Mountains. And if I didn't have these material things, I would probably be a happier person. I have some very wealthy mates, one one's who's nearly a billionaire, but he's so miserable. And it's amazing. He doesn't give anything to charity. He's really got a chip on his shoulder. And he's, he, he would be a lot happier if he could be more generous if he had less money. So don't think this search for material wealth is the end all of everything. It certainly isn't. I've just got one final question. It's about, uh, it's about the coal industry. In Australia, it's a very significant part of, uh, of our economy. It's also a major contributor to climate change. Apart from the sort of productivity issues that you're talking about and, and not seeking so much growth from our economy, if you remove something like the coal industry from the economy, it would really be a major hit, much more than one, you know, much more than half a percent. Oh, you'd have a catastrophic recession if that happened, and that's why anything has to be done slowly. I've made that very clear in the book that you just can't cha- you can't change. We're on this express train, and of capitalism, and we're feeding the boiler with growth and pushing coal and oil and everything in, and it's speeding up, but it's heading to a precipice. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you have to slow it down. It's impossible to stop it instantly, but you've got to slow it down and stop it before it goes over the wall. And uh, the incredibly good thing is that the amount of energy coming from the sun is 5000 times more than we need. And the only reason we can't use that, believe it or not, we can provide all of the energy for Australia, even at our wasteful present usage in 100 kilometres by 100 kilometres of solar cells, 12% efficient solar cells sitting on the ground. The only reason we can't do that at the moment is we haven't worked out a way of storing that energy for up to a week when we have cloud cover. By the way, in the book, I'm quite against these wind farms. I just think they destroy our landscape. It's, It's like putting industry into the country. But with flat solar cells that can be hidden from the road by some trees, And they're already working on methods of storage. One is you compress a gas, put it into a big insulated container, and then at night time, you expand the gas through a turbine. That will happen, and I can see us eventually being completely provided with power from the sun. But you have to do that very, very slowly. Um, I'd prefer to go slow on using coal and using oil because it's always left there. If ever there was an emergency in the world, a hundred years or a thousand years to come, it's always going to be there. I remember I uh, helped Bob Brown when it came to the damming, the the plan they were going to dam the Gordon River below Franklin. And the biggest point I made to everyone is, look, if we can not put that dam in now, we always can in the future. It's always got the potential to do that if we actually needed it for mankind. But let's protect it now. My attitude is the same with leaving coal and oil, if possible, some of it in the ground. It's there for emergency usage, but let's go flat out now at looking at alternatives. And they're absolutely possible. They will be expensive. We'll have to make sacrifices. We, we have lived beyond our means. People of my generation have basically bludged on our children and grandchildren's future. We've got to do something about that. You can't go back. I'm prepared to sacrifice now, and I know many people are, so the kids in the future can have as a fortunate life as we can. Very thorny issues, but thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. Thank you.